The climate challenge, commitment and COP26. Well, we have the first commitment, I suppose, of the International Banking Conference, which is you'll see Mark Carney here next year in Madrid. So do join us for that. Um, the, the next session is about the one that is going to dominate the conversation, certainly in the next uh, 10 days until the conclusion of COP26. And it is about that relationship between business, politics and society in pursuit of 1.5 degrees. Uh, I'm going to ask Anna Botin back uh, up to join us, but also I'm really delighted that we have uh, Holkan Samuelsson and uh, the chief executive of Volvo and uh, Theodor Weimer, the chief executive of Deutsche Börse, uh, do come up uh, and sit on the benches. Just to let you know, we're not sadly going to be doing a recreation of Sunday in the Park with George, the, the Stephen Sondheim musical. The reason for these benches is not only does it give you a sense of green, but also means we respect COVID distancing rules. So please do come up and sit and join us uh, here in the Santander Park. And I think you're here. Each other. Yes, you were bench for each of you there. You're Theodore, you're there. And Hawkeye, you're there. And I come sit here, yes. It has your name here. <laughs> oh, yeah, very good. We look like a collection of rather lonely people in the park, all sitting on our own benches, but we're trying to be careful. Um, you know, I take what Anna said at the start, you know, really seriously, this question about how do you find people, whether in politics or in corporate leadership, who are actually going to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And the reason that I think the team at Santander was so quick, keen to have the three of you is that each of you in your own businesses have made commitments that are way ahead of your sectors. And so I hope that what we can do is understand a little bit about how that works in practice, because presumably it's not entirely easy organizationally, financially, uh, or, or even necessarily with customers. But also, I suppose the real question for us is, is it real, is it enough, and is it going to be fair? And so I wonder, Hawkan, whether I could start with you and, and Volvo. Um, I want to spare your blushes, but Volvo has come out and said, sustainability is as important as safety, all electric vehicles by 2030. I, is that realistic? Uh, I, I think what's important is here to really make uh, sustainability part of our business uh, and uh, really a part of our purpose. You mentioned safety. I mean, we started a long time ago developing safe cars because somebody then, uh, I was not there then, thought that was a good idea for, for the business. And, and it was not uh, driven by regulations or any stars in crash tests or was driven by uh, this should be part of our brand. So it's uh, part of the company purpose. So I think that's really key because if we now do the same with climate change or sustainability, it should have a very natural connection, of course. So we make it part of the business and then it's totally integrated. I mean, it's not special department. It's, it's, uh, Discuss together with the finance and quality and sustainability. And, and what's important is people want to work for a company that has a purpose. So, I mean, if we asked what said we work with sustainability, we will be climate neutral, uh, that would not be attractive. So, uh, we have put it very deep into our purpose as company and, and very concrete uh, targets, all cars electric 2030. And we see how, how then this is part of all discussions in the company. I think that makes a big difference compared with just following uh, rules or regulations. And, and even within Volvo, even within that commitment, can you move fast enough? I, I think I read somewhere that the transition to electric vehicles had been, even since 2018, mm. six plus percent. To get to 100% mm. by 2030 or 50% by 2025, mm. it feels as though you need a huge exponential increase in the uptake of electric vehicles. Mm. Is that feasible? Yeah, we can develop the cars. Uh, and uh, what we cannot for sure know if the customers uh, will buy them, if they are affordable, if they can be charged. 
So in that way, it's a sort of a hen and egg, but I think we can never sit and wait making the cars electric till there is a charging network or till there are new financing systems to, to make them affordable. So I think we just have to believe in this. And, and uh, as I said, it's part of our business. So, and and if, you are, if you can do it as the manufacturer, people talk about some concerns in terms of electrification. One, the charging networks, mm. whether or not they're sufficient let's take Europe as a starting point, Europe-wide, um, but globally they're needed too. Mm. How do you, as a car manufacturer, set a set of expectations for all marketplaces in the timetable that's needed? You know, people talk about that being 2035. Is that feasible? Yeah, I think one, one way is, of course, to be open about your ambitions and, and, and your target as a company. I mean would be bad to have it as a secret and then suddenly you have the electric cars <laughs> out, nobody have built any charging. So I mean, communicating openly about it, talking about it like we're doing today is good because hopefully it's encouraged people to invest in the necessary infrastructure we need because that's also going to be a big business. I mean, it's happened before. I mean, the first gasoline-powered cars, you were quite nervous. I'm old enough to remember that. I mean, at least up in Sweden, and you, you carried a bit an extra bottle with you. So, but then, of course, investments came in gasoline distribution. I, I'm quite sure it will come also in, in, in charging. And, and I mean, it's really important to, is to stop all discussion about alternative. We just lose time. Battery electric vehicles is quite good. Let's now focus on the primary energy needed to, to make him really climate neutral because if you charge them with coal-fired uh, electricity, it won't help. Well, well let's, let's come back to that if we might in a moment, and I'd really like to talk about the fairness issue in terms of you know, so, some of the issues we t talked about from the start of the day. But, Theodor, can we talk a little bit about also what's happening at Deutsche Börse and, I suppose, capital allocation overall? I know you've been a kind of big cheerleader for saying, look, green financial instruments, this is what Deutsche Börse is going to make its name doing. But many people still feel there's just not nearly enough investment in new green technologies. How do you usher the money into it? <clears throat> Firstly, James, let me provide you with my very personal CEO view here. And we all know CEOs at the end of the day have to make trade-offs because you can't do everything. And sometimes we are, we are getting forced by different constituency that we have to finance green, we have to finance everything, but at the end of the day, our capital is limited. And against this background, I made two conscious decisions since um, I was appointed four years ago CEO. I made a conscious decision not to consolidate further exchanges. I could have acquired BME in Madrid. Mm -hmm. I went against it because I felt it's better to go into new asset classes. And one of the asset classes I have identified early on was the asset class of analytics and data. And ESG is all about data, data, data. And the reason why I did this, I, at the end of the day, I, I made a decision three years ago that we should be a, a protagonist or at least a fast follower on the ESG side. I put all my bets on ESG. And while others were talking still about ESG, I invested right two billion, which is the biggest, the biggest um, M&A transactions for 13 years. I invested in ISS, Institutional Shareholder Services. It's famous for proxy. It's famous for governance issues, right? Anna, you know it, right? Because they are after you sometimes. Sorry for that. Mm -hmm. And um, usually they support us. They support us. You. I <laughs> because you're very well underway, I know. So, but what I wanted to say is, I put all my bets on the ESG. We acquired ISS, which is the number three, yeah, the number three globally in the ESG context on the data side. Number one is MSI, number two is Sustainalytics, Morningstar, number three is ISS. And I felt it cannot be that the Americans are dominating again, as they do on the rating side, that they are dominating again the space of ESG, and therefore I, f I thought it's good as a European, and in my heart, I'm a true European, not just a true German, I'm a true European, right? I felt it's good that we own, that we own the data source. And therefore, I think what we need to do, we need to 
right, develop a consistent base of data, of analytics, that people who are active in the space of, sustain, of sustainability, they need to know, they need, we need to get away of the uncertainty. We need, to, that's the big issue on the climate side is, is uncertainty. You need to know in 10 years, right, we need to get rid of combustion en en engines. We need to know what the criteria are that uh, some of the investments of the products of the companies are truly sustainably set up. That is what we need to do. And that is the reason, sorry for one more sentence, and that is the reason why I felt we need to go into this ESG topic on the data side. Data is the key for products, for the, the climate actions, and for the the, the corporations. And can I just, I'm going to come back to you, Theodore, about the investment question I, I asked yeah, originally. Sorry. But you made the data point, and actually, Anna, I was struck that it was the first thing you said when you listed the things that need to be done. Your first point was data. And I'm just interested to know why that's so high up that list of priorities for you. Well, I mean, I'm very much uh, like the, uh, Theodore. How do you pronounce your name? Theodore or Theodore? Both. Both, <laughs> if you want. Theodore. Theodore is more, more appreciated. Yeah. Okay, good. So Theodore. Uh, you know, I, I have a, one of my favorite sentences, my team knows this, is you cannot make progress if we cannot measure. So you can only make progress if you have data and facts. And data only is valuable if it's, say, A, good quality data, and B, consistent data across countries and regions. And so that is essential. By the way, one of the things that worry us is that you mentioned ISS, sustainability. I mean, there's not three, but probably 300, or maybe that's exaggeration, of different standards. Indeed. And so we need one global common standard. Well, maybe two, like IFRS and US GAAP, but not 30. This is one of the problems, because if we're going to measure, first, we need to define what is green i.e. what we call the taxonomy. So it's no good if, I gave the example this morning, if the European Commission decides that this is green and Canada or the US decides something else is green, it's, not, it's going to be very difficult because you have a problem at the base of what is green. But understanding uh, the data and then, of course, collecting the data. This is incredibly difficult because if I go to Hakon and Volvo, he runs a big company, he has committed to this for some time, he's gonna have the data bottom up. Because the biggest issue for banks, for example, is that we cannot be green if our 150 million customers, including four million companies, are not green themselves. Yeah. So Santander has been net zero in our own operation since 2020. We have committed to being you know, net zero 2050 for all our stakeholders. And sorry to say, but uh, when I talk to my customers, big customers like you, you also have committed not just for you, but for your supply chain, the level three. Our level three is humongous. Yeah. <laughs> and so that is why we need governments around the world to agree on what is green, how do you measure, but also what are the transition plans for sectors. Uh, Anna, can we, can we come back? To, can, we, can we just come back to that in a minute? Because I feel like it's a really big discussion. But I need I to say one more thing. Okay, far away. Because I was, I'm going to forget. And Hakon said one thing, which is incredibly important. In the same way as when gasoline was introduced, governments, and this is a fact around the world, gave incentives, which remain until today, to incentivize gasoline. Now they need to put in place policies that do exactly the opposite. And this is across sectors, by the way. It's also cement and other sectors. And that is what we're asking from the private sector is we will do it. We are absolutely willing to do what we need to do. But we also need you to help us with this public policy. No, no, and I want, to, I want to come to this question about the transition of the 150 okay. million customers. I want to come to But I do just want to nail down this data point. Because I think a lot of people in the room are trying to wrap their heads around ESG. And I suppose one of the big questions is this point that Anna makes about the consistency of the data. And Theodore, I'd just like to know what your preference is. Would you like to see, if you like, the marketplace decide, you know, competing groups showing that they've got, if you like, the most detailed and reliable data, or would you like some kind of body, as in audit, as an accountancy, to come in and provide a consistent set of standards for ESG data? That's an excellent to-the-point question. There are two different paradigms. The one paradigm, I call it, for clarification here, the American paradigm. You let the market decide, right? You create Sustainalytics, MSCI, ISS. They take care 
and they develop and they, they develop over time a better and better data set. That is the market orientated approach. And on the other side, yeah, you've got a regulatory approach. I call it a European approach. In Europe, what we are doing, we are running in a huge exercise of taxonomy. Everybody is waiting like, right, like the, the, uh, the little animal in front of the snake, um, what's gonna happen with the taxonomy? And I fear we're gonna create the next huge regulatory elephant, right? Elephant which will foster us to go in the right direction or in the wrong direction. And at the end of the day, it's slow, it's not agile, it's expensive, and it will not allow us to grow anymore. And therefore, I'm a protagonist of the American approach here, of the market approach, of the market approach. And I can only ask and really kindly ask our dear people, the policymakers in, in Brussels and in elsewhere, right? The, the regulation should set the frame, right? But then, the, and then they should set, they should do everything in order to take away the unpredictability and uncertainty in 10 years. And then they should let the, the, the market do its work. I can tell you, if, if we know in 10 years combustion engine um, has to get stopped, the market will develop there in 10 years. We will use technology, we will use innovation, and we will use all the capital available in order to go there. I'm, as a, I'm running the biggest stock exchange in Europe, by far two and a half times bigger than Euronex in Paris and Amsterdam. And I can tell you, I talk to investors day and night. Investors hate uncertainty. Mm. What they realize is today uncertainty in Europe, and therefore they are fading away. We are, we are losing the capital flow. And what we need, desperately need, is we need to get away with uncertainty, and instead what we are doing, we create huge, right, huge frameworks and taxonomy regulations, and that what's gonna happen is probably the next one what happened after the financial service, uh, financial markets crisis in banking, right? We killed the banks, we made them a commodity, and I fear the next what we kill is we kill the investment market. So, so can I ask you to follow up on that? Because, you know, we, Anna, you were talking to Mark about GFANS. And when you, when you listen to the announcements that, the, that, that GFANS makes, the numbers are just amazing and in some ways inspiring, potentially very exciting. But Theodore, when you look at the numbers that we have actual line of sight to, they're a fraction of what's needed. People talk about 650 billion committed out of an IEA number of 6 trillion so far. How do you get the level of investment that's needed in terms of meeting transitions, particularly in energy, transport and food? Firstly, you should not fool yourself, right? As soon as the market starts to go in the right direction, it's an exponential curve, point number one. Point number two, you need to realize as currently 80 to 90% of all the assets and all the, the transformational investments are getting financed via bank debt, right? That's not gonna, that's gonna, that's not gonna work. So we need a capital market unions, capital market union to, to, um, uh, to, to move ahead much more what, what it does in, 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 the, in the past. And last but not least, we need to install stuff like like emerging um, trading systems, right? Emission trading systems, right? What we are doing currently, I, I'm, mm -hmm. we have the, uh, the biggest um, uh, power and gas uh, um, uh, trading uh, system globally, right? We have a market share of north of 60% in Europe, right? So we trade all the power uh, day to day and day ahead, so derivatives and what we are doing currently well, this year we have created 16 billion of revenues for the, for the um, European, Union, European Union member states just from the primary issuance of what we're doing. So at the end of the day, again, we don't need to talk about tools and mechanisms. We need to, to, to talk about the goal and the objective and the market will follow. Uh, Anna, do you want to just touch on that, the, the business investment side, you know, the financing opportunity? How do you see it? No, so first, uh, we were at breakfast this morning. I'm so happy to hear Theodore and a German saying what you're saying, okay? Because Germany, at the end, has been the leader in Europe, and, of course, with France, and we are, the South is here to support you always. But it's incredibly important to speak out on this. And, I, I, you know, let me just give an example of what Theodore is saying. So, if 
And this is where, where, where as he's saying, the framework is really important. We know that you know, gasoline pollutes more than gas. We know that ships around the world could be gas-powered ships, and that this is 30% less polluting than gasoline. However, in the last few years, very few of any gas-powered ships are being built. Why? What is it we would need from governments, and this is exactly the framework, and then let the market see how they get there. You know, to, amortize, to be able to finance a gas-powered ship, we need 20 years, 20. Anything less than that is not economically viable. If we were told, you know what, ships and gas-powered ships, or gas, whatever, there's many ways of cutting this, uh, uh, this elephant, as you said, it is an elephant, would be acceptable for the next 20 years. We would be financing today gas-powered ships that are much less polluting than gasoline. But that's not happening. And that is why it's so, so important to set these frameworks for every industry. So then banks and the private sector and capital markets can finance that. My second point, and I've heard this from Hakon and others uh, who are our customers, there's a very important thing, which is the well to wheel. We can produce all the electric cars in the world, but if the source of that energy yeah. is not clean, you know what, ain't gonna do as much good. So again, this is, you know, of course, energy is the big one, but there's others like cement and agriculture and others. And so having these frameworks, rather than the detail bottom up, and my third point also to amplify what Theodore said, is that what we learned in the great financial crises is that very detailed regulation takes a long time, things change, and then regulation is not able to keep pace. So again, going to frameworks that give the flexibility to the market to adapt is incredibly important. Because if we don't have growth, sustainable growth is not gonna happen. Each one of those two words is as important. Sustainable growth. Yes. To get sustainability, you need growth. And this is hugely, hugely important to remember. And my last point on regulation, which I've made many times, because whether we like it or not, we're gonna be regulated. Yeah. So Theodore, your world of, you know, let them set a framework and then let the private sector, that's not gonna be enough. Banks will have some regulation. And the issue is when that regulation, if and when it comes, gets front loaded. So anything you say there's a transition usually gets, and if we don't have that capital markets union, that is an issue. How do you finance the transition, especially in Europe? And are we going to, I hope actually in the next session, touch on that question of capital markets union, banking unions, we talk about Europe. And I know Alejandro Kingdalan is going to do a session on the regulatory reset. I wanted to come back to this 150 million. Because, you know, I think, you know, people who've come to the conference in the last few years, actually, it's not as though you've just started talking about climate. We've talked about it every year in recent years. And I've followed you. People here will have seen the TV program. You're going to... Greenland, sort of personally engaged in this whole subject, I sense something that's changed, which is that now the expectations that on banks in particular to be responsible not just for what they can do, if you like, within their own businesses, but within the businesses of their customers, is a set of requirements that is bigger than anything that, that if you like, other industries are being asked for. And I wonder whether or not that's changing your perspective on A, the role of banks, and B, the reasonable expectations of government. That, that's a huge question. So, uh, the, <laughs> so I think Hakan also said it before. So, so we as a business, you know, we are here for our customers. Uh, and our customers are asking us to be responsible. So we believe in responsible banking. I said that at this conference seven years ago. We, of course, we're here to make a profit, but making a profit is not the ultimate goal. That has to come as a consequence of us doing things in the right way. For Santander, that means doing things in a way that is simple and personal and fair for all our stakeholders, including for our shareholders, right? And if my shareholders don't get an adequate return, you know what? I'm not gonna be able to do a good job for society or my team or my customers because I would not be able to support them. We're in, a, we're in a market economy where we compete for capital. We don't just compete with the US banks or other banks outside Europe, we compete with the big tech. We do payments 
We do online banking with companies that play by a totally different set of rules. So I have a, a and if you're, so I just finish, I can go on and on about this, but <laughs> if you're a payment service provider in the European Union and you happen to be called a bank, your regulation is here. If you're a payment service provider and there are companies, including this one that makes this device, <laughs> that are three times the economy of Spain, the rules on payments are down here. So this is what we're asking when we say a fair transition. It applies, and this is just a bit of a side way of saying that we need rules that apply to everybody in a consistent way with data that is comparable. And it's not just for the climate, but also for the digital revolution, because again, let's remember, this is about growth. Mm -hmm. If we don't get capital to European companies and European banks, we cannot compete in anything else, and we're not going to make a just transition. Hawk, you want to come back in? No, no I just wanted, uh, we talk a lot about, of course, investing in the right thing, and, and we're looking what will be prescribed or regulated from somebody above. But if you look into our situation with electric cars, we believe that is a good solution, okay, subject to that we have primary energy. But then, one example of something that really could uh, accelerate this de development would be charging the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And if that came from the authorities, it's probably as a, a charging pole out in the field in the rain. If the market would do that, it would be a sort of a, a resting place, more like an airport lounge with uh, cafes, restaurants, for sure a roof, a rain protection. <laughs> So, why, how could the two of you, equity market, debt market, how could you be better in supporting such initiatives? I mean, you don't need to wait for regulations. Are we good enough in supporting that? I just see that too little is happening in charging. Either there are no people with ideas or you don't let them the money. I don't know what to... No, no, wait. Uh, there's a company, there's a company called Ample that uh, is based in San Francisco that is going to start with Spain that is not just going to do recharging batteries, but battery swapping. Mm. The infrastructure needed for battery swapping is a fraction of the cost of the infrastructure for charging. What we need is what Theodore said. We need some frameworks, and by the way, let me just say the positive, the fact that Europe says by 2030, all vehicles have to be electric. Mm. Great, let's now work towards that. Mm. What we're asking then is, and by the way, it could be swapping batteries or recharging or a combination, and the market will do it. Could but don't both. put the, but don't tell banks, you're gonna need more capital because after 2030, we're not sure if you can be you know, you're going to be financing Volvo, but not the competitor of Volvo, because Volvo, you know, that is where we have an issue. That's why the policy, the framework, and then the regulation has to allow us to then finance that transition in, a, in, in the right way. Yeah, because, I mean, it would be great if money would go there, not because somebody says we need to invest in that, but somebody saw a great profit by investing into that. that incentives, be, right, better incentives. That would be much faster than... A, right. Than a... Incentivize green lending instead of disincentivizing the other one. Theodore, you want to respond? <clears throat> this is a very sophisticated audience here, and therefore I try a sophisticated approach. I'm an economist, right, by education. And um, I understand truly the following, right? 10, 15 years ago, yeah, capital was a scarce, was a scarce resource. Meanwhile, given the, the, um, the means right, um, of um, the governments and of the, the national banks, right, we have flooded the market with money. And my theory is money is not scarce anymore. Right? True resources are scarce. Mm -hmm. And what we see is, at the end of the day, we still keep um, a shareholder uh, paradigm, right? So we truly think we need to cope with the weighted um, average cost of capital um, of, um, of our investors. And the truth is that the true cost of equity are much lower than we think. 
because money is not scarce anymore. That's a revolutionary theory yep. of a CEO of a stock exchange. So please don't quote me. Right? <laughs> so that's one dimension. The second dimension, and that is what, what he was making, Hakan was making. We see increasingly ecosystems developing, not just companies. You were mentioning the 150 million customers. We see Amazon. Everybody understands Amazon. Amazon is making profit on the negative cost of social public goods, mm -hmm. right? Because they destroy yeah. the towns, the cities, and so forth. Negative cost, right? And we could argue that if we go towards, towards um, um, the immobility, we need to involve positive social costs if we invest in charging stations. So we need a completely different approach how we steer shareholder yeah, activities Right? And at the end of the day, the only solution theoretically can be that we move away from a narrow shareholder paradigm to a broader stakeholder approach. Well, well, Theodore, that's, we'll sorry, that's so, what we call externalities. You're actually, some companies are actually benefiting from exactly. externalities. And you're totally right. That's why we need common rules for a digital economy where you create value, where you pay taxes and so on. And this is what some of these new models are creating externalities that everybody's paying for. Exactly, and I'm not prepared as a taxpayer to pay for charging that he's gonna get a benefit, right, as Volvo. So this cannot be, therefore we need to have yeah, balancing mechanisms between these, the ecosystem. But, but, but I mean, Theodore, just to say, I hope in the course of the day we'll keep coming back to that theme, that idea, because the extent to which our economy enables people to make money from negative social goods, but doesn't necessarily or sufficiently reward those people who are delivering positive social goods, mm -hmm. I suppose cuts to the heart of this whole conversation around roles and responsibilities at this turning point. So I hope we will make that theme of the day. I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of this question I had at the start, which was about fairness. And I think there is a real concern that the climate agenda, as urgent as it is, is out of touch with certain groups of people. It's out of touch with people who are poor in developing countries who haven't had the opportunities that people in developed countries have. It's out of touch with people within developed economies who are at the lower end of the income scale over those people at the top of the income scale. And I just wondered whether I could come to each of you on this issue not least, and I'll come to you on this too, Anna, in the context of concerns about inflation and cost of living. So, Hawken, can I, can I start with you? When you think about the electrification of vehicles, how do you make that a revolution for everyone? Uh, I think you need to be creative. Uh, I mean, producing all the, all the cars cheap for, for uh, poorer countries cannot be a solution. I think we must lead this be able to be able to find new technology and then we have to make it affordable for, for uh, people in Europe who don't want to pay food but also for other countries. And I think we should think also then sustainability because sustainability is really durability. A product should last longer, that's sustainable. And I think we should work much more with second life uh, vehicles, for example. Could be a great alternative to have a second life vehicle for hmm. people who are, don't have the affordability instead of buying cheap car. New, new uh, but uh, environmentally not so good new car. Okay, okay. High, new technology in the second life. That's uh, something we are thinking about as, as um, ways of reaching uh, less lower income segments. Theodore. My view is very clear. My compass is telling me inequality yeah, is the source of competition and therefore inequality is the source of growth and profitability. That's very clear. And what we need, we need growth in order to create tax, right? Power, tax. Um, 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 and then at the end of the day, the policy maker, makers need to distribute the taxes generated to those who cannot afford to play in the, in the Champions League game. And therefore, for me, it's very clear. The advantage of Europe is we have better social systems than other regions. Right, and therefore, but we should not mix it up. 
We need to keep right, the toughest competition available right, in, the, in order to generate right, uh, profits and uh, capital and growth, and then we need to redistribute, and that's not my job, that's the job of the policymakers. <laughs> All right, Theodore, I think because of time constraints, we'll let you get away with that. And I'm going to Anna on the... But Anna, will you give us your last thought on this? And the reason I did make the point about inflation is that I think you talk about sustainable growth. For a lot of people, there's an issue, isn't there, which is about cost of living within this changing environment. Well, I mean, just the, we, we, don't, we, we don't have more time, but, uh, of course, inflation... You know, in, in a world where money has become like plentiful, to say the least, um, at the end of the day, you know, inflation has a risk of coming back. We're hearing from policymakers it's transitory. Inflation hits the poorest hardest. We know that in emerging economies. That's, we've seen that in, in Europe. We haven't seen it for a while. So I do think we need to help our customers go green. We need to help them understand what it is they need to do, but very importantly, how they pay for it. So we go back to what we've been saying. We need private sector to be working uh, with governments to some extent, with whoever's going to set the rules, whether it's markets or markets with governments. I do think it's all of us together. Mm -hmm. And even though it's really difficult, our aim should be to get this right. And we need to get it right for my customers in Puerto Llano mm -hmm. and for my customers in Mexico, Brazil, that beyond going green, which even they want to, also need to buy a home for the first time. So again, it's our responsibility to get this right. Um, and, and we cannot do it alone from the private sector. Mm. We need to work together with the public sector, with regulators, and, you know, and, 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 and get it right. But, but there is one thing, Anna, it strikes me, that there, that there is a level of cooperation, collaboration within the private sector. You talked about it at the start, about people working together. And I just wanted to bring in, Bill Winters couldn't be here in person, but the chief executive of Standard Chartered, and as many of you know, one of the leaders on the whole uh, finance and climate agenda, um, just recorded a few comments. And before we finish this session, I just wanted to make sure we'd heard from Bill. Can we play his tape? I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you about sustainability, uh, voluntary carbon markets in particular, especially in the context of COP26. But the opportunities in the private sector are, are truly huge. And in fact, the private sector can largely solve this problem if we really put our shoulders into it. Now, for the financial services sector, that's meant uh, convening bodies like the, the, the Glasgow uh, Financial Alliance for Net Zero or the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Uh, both of which uh, Standard Chartered is, is, is centrally involved with, uh, to help agree the, the approach to getting appropriate data. Now, our, our, we've made the net zero commitment, but that the transition plan itself is to varying degrees a function of the data that we can get from our clients, the bulk of our emissions, of course, coming from uh, our finance emissions with clients. So having a, 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 a clear and, and consistent approach to acquiring, aggregating that data, having some agreed uh, methodology in terms of, of, of mapping that data back to, to different types of products. And these are all, uh, all clear, clear things. Now, what would also be, be critically helpful in this regard would be to have a clear price for carbon. And I think that always helps corporate decision making uh, when there's an, an understanding what the financial targets are that you're shooting for. Uh, when we think about, about the, the, the lack of a price of carbon today, it's a real impediment. And we can say, well, in fact, I mean, there are lots of prices for carbon. There's a, there's a European emission trading system price for carbon. There's a California exchange price for carbon. There is a voluntary carbon market today, although it's quite small and not very transparent. Uh, so my fundamental view is that the existence of a big, robust, high integrity carbon market in which all stakeholders have high confidence. So high confidence that the, the, the contracts will work, high confidence that the projects are legitimate, high confidence that the the purchase of a credit will actually translate into reductions in carbon in the environment. This is an absolutely critical function of a market that is not being served today. We could call it a market failure. Uh, the opportunity at this point is for all of us to put our shoulders into creating that credible and scaled and scalable voluntary carbon market. Thank you very much. I, I thought it was really important that we all got to hear from Bill Winters, not least because he runs a bank at the scale of Standard Chartered, but it's really striking, Anna, to hear you, to hear Mark Carney, to hear you, Theodore, everyone talking about a move towards carbon pricing. I, I know it's not strictly uh, the requirement of COP to deliver that, but it does feel as though something is on the move. I know that you're headed to Glasgow and that you know, leaders of the financial services industry will be there tomorrow. So. Um, 
Just on behalf of all of us, uh, I hope you join me in thinking that this first panel was extremely illuminating and fascinating. Horkan, thank you for making the journey to be here. Anna, good to see you as ever. And Theodore, thank you also for joining us. Round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.